Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm very excited for everybody here to join us today to talk a little bit about how can civil society participate in the decentralized future of the web. So my name is Shruti Ramaswamy. I'm with the team at TechSoup. For any of you that might not be as familiar with us, TechSoup is a global nonprofit with a mission to support other nonprofits around the world with access and support to the technology solutions and resources that they need to fulfill their missions. This event is part of the Public Good App House series. This is a series of events that focus on purpose-built digital solutions designed to help civil society achieve its objectives. Today, we're going to be focusing on solutions built on the technologies that are part of the decentralized web, also known as Web3. This is the first of many events that are a part of a project supported by an award from the File Cohen Foundation for the Decentralized Web. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to tell you a little bit about why we're excited about this work and why TechSoup is actually engaging and participating here. We believe civil society deserves digital solutions that are built to meet their needs. That means organizations across the sector should take advantage of emerging technologies as much as they should take advantage of existing technologies. And we want to support groups like the ones that are going to be speaking today that focus on the specific uses for civil society in leveraging those emerging solutions. So we're going to learn a little bit more about it today, but what are decentralized web technologies? Goes by a lot of names. I said Web3. We've settled on D-Web. Blockchain is an essential technology in understanding some of the decentralized web. Blockchain is a record of transactions that's maintained by a distributed network of users rather than essential organizations. So transactions happen peer to peer as opposed to with intermediaries. So it makes it almost impossible for any individual or group to alter a record once it's been made. And the fabric of the way blockchain works is really how we're thinking a little bit more about the decentralized web technologies as well. You can find out a lot more about this work in a blog post that my fantastic colleague who's not here with us today, Marnie Webb, has written. We'll put that link in chat so you can, and we'll share it as part of our follow-up so you can engage more. But the goal here today is to learn more about that with our fantastic speakers. You'll have a better understanding coming out of today about these technologies and specifically how these technologies can be put to work to achieve the goals that we have within civil society. Today, we are excited to have two speakers. The first speaker is Hunter Tresseter. He is the head of Global Social Impact Programs with the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. In this role, he leads a team that's passionately focused on improving the internet by increasing the use of open, decentralized systems and technology. After we hear from Hunter, we'll also hear from Nathan Freitas, director of The Guardian Project. The Guardian Project is a global open source mobile security collaborative with millions of users and beneficiaries worldwide. With that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Hunter, to introduce yourself and your work and really excited to hear more about it. Thank you, Shruti. I appreciate you and TechSoup bringing us all together today. It's always so nice to meet with a group of people who are focused on improving the lives of others. Frankly, for me, it's refreshing and heartening to be surrounded by people who recognize the potential for technology to improve lives and who are dedicated to doing the necessary hard work. For those who are just meeting me today, as Shruti mentioned, my name is Hunter Tresseter. I'm the head of Global Social Impact Programs at Filecoin Foundation and Filecoin Foundation Decentralized Web. Prior to joining what we call FF slash FFTW in 2021, I spent 15 years as a career diplomat in the U.S. Foreign Service. And much of that time was focused on human rights and online hordes, which is how I ended up at FF. And uh, now in the U.S. Foreign Service, we often measure time in presidential administrations. And there was this period towards the end of President Obama's first term when those of us who were working on digital and cyber matters noticed a distinct change in the attitude of many governments, including our own towards technology. And that shifting attitude could be encapsulated like this. Policymakers had gone from focusing on the potential of technology to sharply focusing on its downsides. Suddenly, colleagues who left government for tech jobs went from being celebrated to those successors, seeing whispered about as having taken a payday to represent the dark side. Given this, it's natural that people ask the nationally why I left government. To be frank with this audience here, I had lost my confidence that any U.S. administration was ever going to do a good job of promoting technology's potential while also managing its risks. Being in government in that period felt like all we ever did was impotently focus on the potential negatives of technology. 
I left because I wanted to go back to a time and a place where technology had potential again. A time where it felt like the hidden days of the early 2010s when people would talk about empowerment, connecting, and that funny little thing, you know, about not being. Feels these days like many people in the tech industry spend their time focused on maximizing shareholder value or increasing market share. And don't get me wrong, I know that any business needs to make money. But I relish the idea of technology that focuses on helping people and not on squeezing users for every last hour they could get. So why have I spent so much time on my personal soapbox telling you about my feelings? Because I suspect that many of us here have similar origin stories. We watch the internet evolve from a place of promise to its current state, where it feels that many interactions are predatory, their core. The HBO series Silicon Valley did an excellent job of summarizing this situation. During an episode in the show's final season, Richard Hendricks, the main character and founder of a decentralized technology company, was testifying to web monopolies in front of Congress. He notes that the web monopolies are modern royalty reading kingdoms that are larger than any empire in human history. They are so entrenched that there is no authority on earth that can force them to change their ways. So given that, what is the solution? Richard's proposed solution was that similar to how the founders of the United States fled Europe to get away from monarchies that could not overthrow, the solution here is to move away from a centralized internet to a place where the incentives are fundamentally different. An open, decentralized internet where predatory behavior is difficult, if not impossible, where the users have control over their online lives. An internet by the people, of the people, for the people. Now is a good time to segue to telling you about the Final Play Foundation, which I know is not the most subtle of segues to promoting our organization. Now we actually have two organizations. Final Play Foundation, or what we refer to as SS, is the steward of the Final Play Channel. Final Play itself is a decentralized data storage network that provides an alternative to tech and puts people in control of their own data. Filecoin Foundation, the decentralized web, or what we refer to as FFDW, is a non-profit private operating foundation that seeks to advance human powers by furthering the future of the web through education, research, and development. As I mentioned before, I run the social impact programs at Filecoin Foundation. Almost all of my team's work is conducted through FFDW, the non-profit side of our two foundations. I'm joined today by two of my outstanding colleagues, in the interest of time, or what to introduce them myself, but they'll be here to help answer any questions you may have. Caitlin Donovan is the program manager overseeing our work cultural preservation, education, and policy. Raylan Donovan is the program manager leading our efforts on human rights, journalism, and science. And Ian Davis is the partner engineer who helps our project partners identify and utilize the best de decentralized technology tools for their needs. Just to give you a quick overview of how our team approaches its work, I like to describe our mission as following the ABCs. A is accelerate, that's accelerate the adoption of open decentralized technologies. The B is build, that's build communities of users and champions of open decentralized technologies. And the C is communicate, and that's communicate the values and benefits of open decentralized technologies to wider audiences. So if I'm talking to a group dedicated to using technology for the public good, it'd be fair to expect that many of you are wondering why SFTW invests so much money in its social good projects. The simple answer, from a team perspective, is that all of us who are here today representing FIS and FFTW have built their careers around trying to make the world better. We're all personally inclined to pursue opportunities that center around helping people, just like I suspect all of you. The more complicated answer is that the incentive structure of the internet is, in many of our opinions, broken. It prioritizes profit over helping people. If we think that Web3 can improve in this area, it only makes sense that, as a foundation, we would support organizations and projects that are focused on helping humanity over making a profit. Now, what kind of social good challenges can decentralized technologies address? Filecoin, being a decentralized storage protocol, is often used to address the challenge of making data more accessible. Let me give you some quick examples. Through a collaboration with University of Maryland's Department of Geographical Sciences, we're making geospatial data sets more accessible. One of the aspects of geospatial data that I personally find incredibly frustrating is that while much of this data is collected by governments using taxpayer funds, it is near inaccessible unless you're willing to pay the more profit corporations to corral the data behind paywalls. Our collaboration with UMD resulted in a project that hosts massive geospatial data sets on file in an open, accessible, and redundantly stored platform. 
Similarly, government data itself is often difficult for citizens to access. This can be for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that governments don't budget nearly as much money as you might say for making their information accessible. This is especially true when the data is natively analog. Through a collaboration with Internet Archives, we're building Democracy's Library, a free, open to NDR of government research and publications. Now, sometimes, on the other hand, information can be difficult to obtain, not because governments don't have this funding or the resources, but because they're deadly working to restrict access. Such was the case with our project partner, Mott Rock, which had its entire document cloud platform blocked by the government of Australia after an Australian media outlet posted leaked government documents on the document cloud platform. By redundantly storing the document cloud database on the platform, Muckrock is able to make its files significantly more resistant to censorship. Now, as you can see, many of our projects revolve around making important information open and accessible. Thank you for all your time this morning. Now I'm going to turn the stage over to another of our project partners, Guardian Project. Nathan, the founder and director of Guardian Project, is going to talk into some of the exciting ways that his organization is leveraging decentralized technologies for social good. My name is Nathan. Freitas, and my pronouns are he, him, and I'm here to present our work on proof mode, which is a decentralized technology in the kind of the old school sense of applications running on devices, but also one that takes advantage of the decentralized web technology and blockchain and other solution. I've been working on mobile technology for Wow. 25 years at least. I've been a fan of kind of small portable computers from the Apple Newton to the Palm Pilot and Blackberry to early smartphones and you know, the potential for these little supercomputers in our pocket, especially when they have all of these wireless radios, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G is just amazing if used in the right way, if applied in the right way. So our work at Guardian Project has, for 15 years, has focused on that. How do we build technologies that empower the end user through their device, as opposed to draw them in more to distraction and consumption? And the, one of the earliest things we did, and I saw the question already about authoritarian states, the great firewall and things like that. One of our original projects was getting the Tor network running on smartphones. And we built Orbot for Android and now iOS and helped Tor bring their technologies to mobile phones. And we're acutely aware of the censorship and network filtering that is a reality for so many people, an increasing reality around the world. So this is something that we can get back to, but definitely part of what I want to talk about. And Nathan, do you mind just explaining the Tor technologies really quickly for people sure. who might not be familiar? Tor is one of the original sort of ways to get around network firewalls and censorship. So it's a volunteer, decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer network that allows your computer to be part of a network that helps other people sort of hop through your computer and a few other computers to get where they want to go. And Tor has been an, an open source technology in, in, in a decentralized way for yeah over 20 years and a lot of ideas around things like the peer-to-peer -peer networks build on tour especially if they're thinking about privacy okay so proof mode is the is something that we've worked on for quite a while but really have been able to increase our attention and efforts on thanks to the support of the filecoin foundation for the decentralized web a few years ago they were prescient enough and i was prepared enough to come together and realize this was a moment that, you know, while we want to increase speech and freedom and access the ideas of misinformation and disinformation and these on uh, the ideas, the realities that these are a huge problem when you, the more you enable the free flow of information, the more you have people trying to uh, poison that flow in a way. So we need more technologies to combat that. And so to start off with something fun. This is our disinformation fighting scavenger hunt. And we actually ran this in New York with the Filecoin Foundation folks and also at the decentralized web camp, which was last June in California. And this is a way you can think of proof mode. It's a way to do a, a scavenger hunt where you know people won't cheat. And we sent people out in New York City to take pictures of things around and they had 24 hours to do it. 
And whoever won, and, and we also did it at the D web camp with things from nature. And the idea is you get our proof mode app, you use your smartphone camera, you capture proof that you did see these things, you return to a fact checker, they verify your proof, and then you get an award, right? So we're creating this kind of game to teach people this behavior of capturing verified photos and videos. And behind the scenes, what the proof mode technology does is gather extra signals from your phone, from the network, anything we can pull in maybe because there's so much information about where you are and what your device is doing. And we add that data with cryptographic signatures. So like a PGP key signing, and we notarize through some third-party notarization service on the internet we'll talk about. And that data is then, instead of just a picture, you have a proof bundle. And then that can be shared, say, over something like Signal or Dropbox or Bluetooth, however you decide. Or even through the interplanetary file system, which is the underlying protocol that Filecoin is built on. And we'll talk about that more in a second. So you, you take a photo and you share the proof bundle of that photo with someone. They receive a bunch of data, which they can then use to verify. So we ran this game in New York City in real time. I was getting entries in over Signal that were from different players. We were pulling these together, verifying them and deciding who our winner was. And so we had two winners and these are some of the photos that they took as part of the game. And they got some nice AirPods courtesy of Aquin Foundation. So. It was a fun way to engage people in play and a kind of training, train the trainers and to start asking these questions about, oh, how could this work? How could we use this? As opposed to waiting for a crisis moment, right? Or waiting for the actual thing. And these are new behaviors we need to understand and think about with how we use these cameras, these smart cameras around us in a positive way for civil society. You'll see though, back here, I mentioned a lot of things that are already decentralized web technology. We're using the app and the captures all happening on my phone. I can share via different messenger apps. I can share via AirDrop, Bluetooth nearby. I can upload to a local file server. I can use the interplanetary file system, IPFS. And so all of these things are really about you are in charge of how and where you're sharing your data and through what conduits. It's not, we don't have proofmode.org, the centralized proof cloud service that will solve all your problems. We are not a gatekeeper or a silo in that way. So what is it that we're working on here? And this was a great piece of research done with the Shorenstein Center, Claire Wardle and Hussein Derek Sean, about seven types of myths and disinformation. And First of all, yeah, anyone who says every technology can address every problem, of course, you probably shouldn't listen to them. What we've tried to do is figure out what aspects of this problem of mis and disinformation are we actually able to support? And so one is imposter content about who is the actual source? Can you identify the source and trust that it came from that source? And so we use signing of photos, an easy integrated way to have a cryptographic identity this can be through something like PGP, pretty good privacy, which is a very old way of doing a verified identity and signing of data, or it can be through X509 certificates, which is part of the Adobe content authenticity initiative for establishing identity. And it's a, an industry-wide initiative with Microsoft and others. And you also think, see things like wallets in, in Ethereum and cryptographic wallets are just an, another way to identify yourself. So these are things we're integrating into proof mode. Fabricated content is another thing we're trying to combat. It, it's not real. It's been edited. It's meant to deceive. It's not the whole clip. It's someone else's clip that's been Photoshopped. These are all important things that happen all the time. And these need to be combated and proof mode ensures that shows that this was an original clip captured on a device. This is the entire thing unedited. False context is when someone takes something from one incident and shares it somewhere else. You see this all the time. Oh, look, there's, there's flooding in New York and look, there's sharks in the East River. And, or maybe it's a photo of a, sh of a shark on another day in another river, but they're taking things from one place. And often this is even done by mistake. I often see this with 
the work I do in the Tibet movement. Uh, there'll be a photo of Tibetans protesting in Nepal or India, and someone will say, Tibetans protesting in Tibet. And you're just like, please don't say that. It's like, confuses everybody and hurts the cause in all ways. And manipulated content, which is a little bit like fabricated about things being manipulated versus, oh, sorry, 100% false. So something fabricated like using a generative AI, right? Making up new imagery versus something that is manipulated or edited. Yeah. So this is, these are the four areas we are focused on addressing with proof mode in different ways. Happy to talk more about them. So we came up with an idea with proof mode about a three layer verification. I think I was inspired by the three body problem, something about threes and trinities and stools and being stable. Integrity is the first step in our process, which is all about notarization, signing. Does something have it, integrity in itself? And can more than one person vouch for that integrity? Consistency is you have a photo or a bunch of photos. Is all the data kind of matching up internally? Are these all, does this make sense in and of itself with the phone, the signals? Does everything kind of line up? Are there any flags that say, this one looks weird, this one stands out, this doesn't make sense for the phone that it's supposed to come from? So we do that check. And then synchrony is, does this data match the time and place and environment that it supposedly came from? And there's some external signals. And, and this is really a concept. This isn't an app or code. We've put it into code and we'll talk about that. But this is an idea to think about three ways of evaluating any information. So this was, here's a bunch of photos from a beach, Earth Day beach cleanup I did with my family out in beautiful Cape Cod. We have a sort of humorous blog post about we all go and clean up trash and you're just picking stuff up and a little gross, it's fun, you're walking around, I don't know, you do it, you feel good, you take a picture, yay. So we took a lot of pictures and we use proof mode to do it all along the way. My family often has to put up with me testing technology with them. We found some amazing skeleton bones and alcohol and plastics. And there were some interesting trends. A lot of those plastic, like dental teeth things wash up in the ocean. Please don't use those. Anyway, so here's a bunch of pictures. That's nice, right? Then behind the pictures, you'll see some of the dots on the map that you can see that, yeah, roughly this did happen. There's a timestamp when I said I really did it in the place went. But in fact, there's tons of little points for every piece of trash picked up. And these points are combination of GPS and cellular tower and really precise data and altitude and anything we can suck in beyond just Latin lawn. There's quite a bit more. And you could do this every year maybe and see, is there a trend? Are things changing? Are different kinds of trash happening in different places? is a current changing that was causing something to deposit more trash there uh, in certain seasons, right? So you start to take pictures and really make it into data. This beach is a real place with sea turtles, right? So this is an important thing and we could have more data related to sea turtles as well. And this is a setup proof. And I'll talk about our tool to verify. We showed how many photos were taken through what time, how far I traveled, did it verify? Not every check has to be checked. It's a an additive thing. It's not a binary. It's here's a bunch of signals and you can trust this. So on proofmode.org, you can see the whole blog post. So this was a way to make a trash pickup more fun, interactive, meaningful, and turn this action into verifiable data. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So as another example, this is a Occupy protest, I think on Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Bridge years ago. And you can just have the photos or you can have the photo with lots of other data added on top of it and multiple pieces of data synced together, cellular towers, Wi-Fi, notarize and turn it into evidence to combat police violence, to show that someone was not violent when they're being accused of it. There's so much ways that this can become data that is submittable in court. And we work with Starling Labs, another partner of Filecoin Foundation and ours, to actually submit a cryptographic docket to the International Criminal Court with regards to evidence of war crimes in Ukraine. So this is happening now, and it takes a lot of really smart legal people and technologists at Starling to pull this all together into, yeah, this amazing effort, but we were happy and we've been thinking about this for over a decade of how that could happen. 
And now, of course, we've got generative AI. This is a picture I generated. I went to Stable Diffusion running on my computer, another decentralized technology. These AI models are decentralized, in fact. And I said, no, please arrest, please press conference. <laughs> press conference. <laughs> and it made this wacky photo with lots of blurry faces. And uh, someone might've thought it was real. If I spent more time, I probably could have come up with something. And so just this idea of like, just dropping a random JPEG of a photo online and expecting everyone to believe it are over and should be over. And we need ways to, to also publish verification data with it. And so that's something that is part of our work. We have another blog post about this on our site. Of course, with, we saw this recently in New York with former elected official, I guess, elected president who, you know, had this happen to him and it could happen to anyone that fake photos are created of you generated to get on the hype train. So on the decentralized verification process, we have a tool called proof check, which is really has the decentralized web in its core. We didn't want to build a website for you to upload proof to, because then we would have this problem of we have your data and we're now somehow liable and we can block it or censor it or be legally held accountable. Plus it's really inefficient. If you have a hundred megabyte or a gigabyte video with proof to upload it to us, it costs us a lot of money. So proof check is a DAP, a decentralized web app served up over IPFS, but you just go to it like a web page, proofcheck.gpfs.link. I can share that later. It'll be on, it's on our website again, proofmode.org. It can retrieve proof via IPFS, but it's also, it runs all local on your computer. Once you open it, it looks like a web page, but it's actually an app on your computer. And when you load your proof data, it's running locally in the app. So it's, it'll be instant the way it loads the video. It does PGP verification. It verifies third-party notary signatures. It does the consistency check, the synchrony check, and it's very soon going to then allow you to then put a stamp that you have reviewed this and then upload that to Filecoin web3.storage so that you can then have your sort of verified I am a person with an identity and I have looked at this and I say this is good and then permanently store that on web3.storage for however long. Yeah, so we're really excited. This combines Rust and Python and web technology and a bunch of wild things. This is just a quick diagram showing this flow. This is Yvonne Ng of witness.org, an amazing partner of ours for so many years uh, and another part of the Alcoin Foundation community working on preserving the most sort of essential data and documentation on the decentralized web. So this is a real person who does this kind of work of verifying media and is using proof mode and starting to use proof check soon in their work and workflow and a variety of other services that you can use to archive and preserve data. One of the features we're working on, and I'm gonna speed up a little because I'm going long, is uploading directly into IPFS from a mobile device. This is still really hard and we're working on it. And there's various efforts of how do I make my phone directly part of the decentralized web? That's not there yet, to be honest. It puts too much pressure on the phone, battery, network, we can get it to work in limited cases, but it's not good enough for kind of the whole world we want to support yet. But I know people are working on this and we, we have it working, but we're being careful about this because we care about battery life and storage and network usage. Because as you'll see, proof of mode is already being used in really some of the most vulnerable kind of least wealth, least financed parts of the activist world. And you don't want to say, yeah, you're on the decentralized web and then have the phone heat up and all their data get used in one tap. But we are working on it and we're believers that we can make this work because it really then starts opening up possibilities for actually nearby sharing if other people are on your same network. So I can talk about that more as well. I'm going to skip this one. It's in the slides. We want to make many copies of data. I'm going to, the cool thing is once you have a little IPFS link, so say I publish, here's my Earth Day trash data set, which I did. You can take that code and use the IPFS tools to pin or copy it. And you can ask everyone in your network to do that. So that's a really interesting activism tool as well to say, this is important data. Everyone, please make a copy of this data. Just run this command. And so we're looking at ways to allow community participation in data preservation. We're really excited about that approach. I'm going to skip. We've got a lot of real code and interesting technology projects behind this. 
There's a lot of engineering happening for people interested in this. And again, with support of Falcon Foundation, we've been able to dig into this and do that. We have apps, we have cloud services, we have our proof, cho proof check verifier, and we can integrate proof mode into other apps. Save, we are playing with integrating into Signal. We have our own apps. We're really excited to be more of an ecosystem around this. And we're also working with the industry content authenticity initiative. So now big idea, I'm gonna skip forward here. So beyond just our work or journalists or activism, we feel like we need to have like almost like an open source Google Earth, Google Street Map for the world that we call baseline and that this could all be preserved on the decentralized web. Our idea is that you can use proof mode to document all sorts of things or a similar tool, but that we can start creating this, a, a Wikipedia, but a multimedia visual Wikipedia that is stored decentralized with many versions and iterating, and that this is an important part of work on climate, on history, on anything you can think of that uh, development and positive movements we want to support, having this kind of verifiable data is important to us and to know what is really real. So we have efforts to support that, to support contribution to our baseline work. And we call that also proof core. And so you can join, learn more about how to join proof core. And there's a kind of guide to welcome. This is what you'll be doing as part of proof core on our website. And we do have some financial support for groups that are already in process of documenting the world for their own purposes and, and supporting their extra effort they would put into using our technology right now to do that. And I'll close with an example of an amazing group, an indigenous caravan in the southern part of Mexico near Chiapas and the Yucatan Peninsula and documenting over two weeks, all of these endangered sites that are indigenous history sites because of the development that is happening. This is happening right now. They are using proof mode to document their rallies, their travel, their interactions with authorities. They are sending us media in real time. We're verifying it and doing what we can to support them. But they're also, you know, frontline quality assurance testing and that they're being paid for their, they know what they're doing and they wanted to be a part of pushing the limits here and documenting this important stuff. And we're really excited to have them and other partners as part of our work. Thank you so much, Nathan. And thank you, Hunter, as well. This was fascinating. I have thousands of questions in my head, but we do have some questions coming up from the, the attendees today as well. And they're in the Q&A as well as some in chat, but I'm Tried to pick on a few of them. I, I want to do one quick question. I think that'll be a little bit fast to answer from Kirk, which was, is IPFS consistent with the terms of service of conventional web hosts, such as stream hosts, GoDaddy, and websites? You mentioned that a little bit, Nathan, in your conversation. So I wonder if you could just tackle that. Yeah, I think it, yeah, it's totally different. It's a protocol that anyone can participate in without a centralized host. So you, it is. It's not anarchy. There aren't, it's not a wild west. There's rules and there's behaviors, but you're not allowing. So one corporate entity to define the terms of service and then change those at any time. It's almost like asking, is there um, terms of service for SMTP or HTTP? Now there's the web three dot storage service, which is an instance that is operated by Filecoin and they are acting as a primary cache, right? So that's a step away from decentralization and they do have terms, but at the core IPFS is a, in some ways better HTP and that is technology and a protocol that is open to all to use. That summarizes a lot of some of the sentiment that we're trying to understand as well. And so the reason that TechSoup is involved is from Raghav, which was, what do you think needs to happen for the public to achieve the tipping point in making Web 3.0 more adopted and normalized? Any tech upgrades, more funding or government regulation milestones that need to be achieved first? Something else? I admire the on-the-ground initiatives the Guardian Project took to make Web 3.0 more accessible, but it seems like the public is still very far from normalizing this tech and skeptic of it, skeptical of it all. So I'd love to open this to all of our panelists and attendees today to try to answer because I think this is definitely something that we're all tackling and honestly, one of the reasons that TechSoup's involved and why we have the public good app house series of events to start normalizing some of this conversation as well. You don't mind, I'll take off on this one because this is a bit of a pet issue for me. 
I'll try to keep it high level because I can fall down a rabbit hole on this question. But, and the high level answer is, from my perspective, is usability. I think the thing that is keeping so many people from really adopting a lot of these decentralized technology projects or initiatives is pure usability. Nathan is one of many partners we had that have been in the kind of the trenches on the front lines of supporting civil society actors around the world for decades of technology. One of the common themes that we hear is that it is not uncommon. And let's go back 10, 15 years. It would not have been uncommon 10, 15 years ago for one of our project partners to supply a human rights organization in a contested environment in Latin America with the technology that could make their privacy more secure, could make their members of their activist communities safer from, from attacks or from surveillance. And those people wouldn't pick up that technology because it wasn't as easy as trying to think back to Tim Pagan. Let's just say Dropbox. It was not as easy as just putting everything on Google Jar. And at the end of the day, people will default to the thing that is I think the simplest to use. So right now, Web3 or decentralized technology tools are off. It's built by deep believers who are building for other deep believers and are not necessarily focused on making it entirely user friendly for people who fall outside of that table. And that's something we're focused on as a foundation. I should add, and that's a plug foundation, but to say that we're not just worried about the problem, we're also investing in trying to solve it. Nathan or anybody else, anything else to add to that? Just tapping in here, I also can back up what Hunter is saying and also add on that I believe education, early exposure, and active engagement with the global community is critical for onboarding the public to D-Web tech. Makers of decentralized tech must share with the public why decentralization matters, as well as expose the public to these options and how to apply these tools in practice. Additionally, just Again, echoing Hunter, makers and builders also need to facilitate open channels for regular feedback to make the technology and tools usable. Thanks, Caitlin. And we put this in the chat, I just want to plug as well. That's some of the goals that TechSoup has here is to bring together the conveners of people who are tackling and looking to learn more, expose more, and bring these back to their organization. So we're going to be hosting a series of events. We're going to have office hours tomorrow with some of the Guardian team as well. So if you want to keep engaging in this conversation, make sure you sign up for these events and then we can make sure we continue this. And so um, there's also, that is something I just appreciate TechSoup for dealer. So thank you. Please keep it coming. We look forward to answering that. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll also just mention, I put it in the question response. There are initiatives like Offline First, which are really about user experience and design approaches to having worlds that are more decentralized and not assuming everyone's connected all the time. So our opinion is if, again, you can build a great experience for someone that, wow, saves them data because when they went to transfer the file, they, the person right next to them, it realized they're on the same Wi-Fi network and it just sent them the file as opposed to having you upload to the cloud and downloading again, using both your battery and data. There's actually very practical everyday values to the decentralized web and the offline first model of design means we have to get app designers and product people and everyone just thinking in this way more. Like I said, with our proof check tool, we started with, I was like, we need to use somehow decentralized web in this tool. And then our team were like, in fact, if we do all the media processing locally, it's blazing fast and costs nobody any data. I was like, there you go. There's the win. Thanks, Sam. We had a few questions related to this theme. So I'm going to merge a couple of questions together. I started off with John who asked, how do you maintain integrity in a web world where people might have different standard of integrity than others? There's also a question I think about the onus is on the users and the participants to take on the role of verification and validation. And how do we ensure trust in a model like that? So if you guys could speak a little bit about that, would be great. And it's funny you use the word integrity, John, because I used it in our proof mode three layer verification model. And to there, we were thinking of it from a bit of a cryptographic perspective, but also does this set of bits and the person claiming the set of bits is legitimate stand up to scrutiny? And I am not one for kind of real name policies. And the answer is government IDs and real faces. I don't believe in that and doesn't really solve problems often. But I am for strong identities that you carry over time. I've had the same kind of primary PGP key for over a decade. And that's like the main identity that many people know and you use and is trusted. 
and is signed by other people. So having these, having persistent identities that could be pseudonyms or anonymous, but are built through reputation and relationships, I think is important. We're missing that kind of integrity online. And I do think that, again, from a usability perspective, there are, we have a long way to go, but there are things happening related to identity, decentralized identity, even are starting through universities where people, again, realize that as a researcher or a student, you need some sort of identity that can travel with you and others can build up that reputation. So I think, yeah, I think we need that work. But the larger issue of integrity, I think, can only be solved by real community. And there's not one value system that's shared around the world. And so, again, decentralized technology really helps empower that kind of human organizing. For me, one of the things that Nathan just said that so resonates is that idea that there's not one truth that is true around the world. And I'd say that as evidence from my experience in the U.S. government, and you've got a singular body that is trying to enforce its vision on different communities and inevitably it's going to be failing those communities. So that, that really strikes a chord with me. And I think that's such a core element of decent for technology is trying to empower those communities. And this is going to sound almost like a trait, maybe, to live their truth rather than us telling them what their truth should be. Also, like I came out of like the trenches of their counter disinformation, counter misinformation efforts in government. And I'm one of those people who doesn't believe that there are any, if any, objective truths in the world. And that's great for answer to me. Uh, another question that we got from and Joseph in Haiti, and there was a little bit of back uh, round that he provided in his question, so I'd encourage y'all to read that. But it builds off of that conversation that you just had illuminated, Hunter, which was, can we really talk about, in his context, Haitian civil society or just civil society? Our vision is not part of a totalizing approach that wants to conceive of the latter as a monolithic and homogeneous block. And I think, interestingly, what you're stating is how the decentralized web can really combat some of those kind of narratives. But I wonder if you wanted to speak to that a bit. There was that for Nathan or for me? Either Nathan or Hunter. I think Nathan's going to love my answer on this one, which is that if I understand the question here, and actually it might be good to get a little bit of clarity here, sir, is the concern that the question focused around a concern that we should be focusing on homogenous blocks of people, I actually don't quite hold the things up. My understanding is that the way that the standard brain processes associations of rabbit is that it tends to completely casualize. And I think that also evidences itself how look at people. Many people self-identify as being part of a community. Um, so I wouldn't want to say that, and I, actually, I really feel like I'm not understanding the question here, but I'll speak to what I think I might be understanding, and then Joseph, please correct me if I'm kind of missing the mark here. But I do think that community is important. People self-identify as being part of communities. Humans tend to categorize things around in these communities as like part of our psychology. And I do think it's important. You want to be able to dial out and be able to talk about bigger picture things. You want to be able to dial in to have that flexibility. Um, and you need to not be forcing people into communities in your head that they don't I mean, to belong to you, that's part of the dialogue rather than you just standing above and looking at them and almost just judging. But, uh, but I don't know. I think that I really think I was understanding the question. No, I, I, at least I interpreted the way that you're going with it. Now, I don't know, Nathan, if you have anything to add here. But to me, some of the parts of the question that he's saying is, is how does the technology support that of building communities, not having a monolithic view of being able to have different kind of viewpoints in that and not have this one homogeneous way that you're approaching community and how does the technology support the various ways that people are going to be thinking about themselves. Can I then add a little adjustment to my answer? Not an adjustment, but just a little detail to it before it's over Nathan that I think an easy example of that would be Mastodon. So we've got this decentralized alternative to Twitter, whereas you join Twitter, you join a model of intensity. You join Mastodon, you're able to select for the communities you want to be a member of, and that is empowering. People are able to self-select rather than having a monolithic entity that's applying an algorithm that at its core is really just about sort of milking you for ad dollars, pushy winner communities that it won't choose to pay. Yeah, I think that's a great answer, Hunter, and, and a lot of people are understanding that through Mastodon, for sure. The I'll go back to the caravan of indigenous activists we're supporting in Mexico right now. 
they're they're deciding with proof mode and their use of decentralized technology how and what to document how to create this archive of media how to publish it and who to trust around the verification of it and the long-term preservation this is they're not structured by a specific website or format or terms of service and they can both retain the media and while it's on their phone it has all the properties of verification and into integrity and consistency and synchrony, but then they can, when possible, push it up through into the decentralized web for long-term preservation in a way they choose. So I think that's a, a self-determination of this indigenous community who's long to choose how and when they use technology in a way that suits them. And I'm excited to see, and I know I have some relationship to the tragedy of the earthquake in Haiti. My brother was in an organization that was there doing solar engineering, off-grid power for hospital clinics and was there right in the aftermath trying to help. And I tried to give him technology to help during a crisis like that. And I know the crisis continued for a long time related to communications and information technology. And I see Joseph's other question about construction and architecture and design. So I think our goal with Proof Mode is there's this... These tools need to work both in everyday life and in these in a crisis, hurricane, war, political shutdown. Assuming people will be connected all the time with a high bandwidth connection is an arrogance and a great privilege of certain parts of the world, and that's just not the reality. So our goal is to create technologies that work for you as a business person, as a community leader, as a teacher, as a student, as an activist, to make sure that what you document can be trusted and verified. If it's a, you're doing a construction on a house and you have a contract issue, that's important. You have a medical issue, a car accident, and you document that someone's dumping trash in the wrong place or polluting the environment, you need to document that. There's so many ways and things throughout our lives that we need to be able to be a verified eyewitness and, and speak that truth to the world. Yeah. So we really want it to be a general purpose tool. And again, because we're not running a website where we have to pay for all the data coming through it and trying to sell it to a certain market, we can do that. And that's, again, a really empowering aspect of the D-Web. We're already running low on time, which is sad because we have so many great questions left. I have one, I think we have time for one more question and then we can close out. But one of the questions, themes that we see are a lot of questions about privacy concerns and how do you maintain anonymity? How can we ensure the protection of privacy? There's also a question about how the technology support accessibility. There's some groups here that are focused, working with access and functional needs. And so curious if you guys have resources or any answers that might help answer those questions right now. Nathan, do you want to take that off first? Sure. Yeah, we have a great ac accessibility lab partners we work with. This is something that we've been working very hard on along with localization, indigenous localization, so accessibility of all kinds. And yeah, it's a it's something that we have resources for, fortunately, and we are aiming to get better. The other really interesting thing with the proof mode tech, at least, and many of these D web techs is there's a lot of building blocks. So things can be reconfigured in very specific ways for like different purposes. I think that we're always interested in as well. So happy to talk more and have testing and feedback and it's an area that we always have a lot more to learn on and bringing on more members of our team, perhaps as well, directly from impacted communities is something we're also working on. Yeah, I think that's a huge yeah. important thing is ensuring that you're very much hearing from these impacted communities about what their needs are rather than you telling them what their needs are. Again, the problem that many governments have, there's this, don't worry about the comment, it takes too long. But I know that we're just hitting time right now. One of the poor things that I would want to just touch on the whole reader Nathan had said is just the fact there's many different building blocks. Uh, the itself is biased towards openness, but in, in the decentralized technology space, there are different building blocks and you can kind of apply them how you'd like. And it is too bad that we're running long time, so I think that some of my teammates would have some excellent inputs providing this answer, but unfortunately, we're at times. Maybe the next one. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's just a, a topic rich with conversation. And I'm really excited to have started that today with you guys today. So thank you everybody for attending. What we have up here right now is a way to continue the conversation. And that is actually just tomorrow. So you can get some of your questions answered directly by the Guardian Project team and felt TechSoup shape our upcoming work in the decentralized web space. Like I mentioned before, we will be following up with an email containing the links that we shared of today, a recording of this event, and there is a brief uh, a survey that um, there's a chat link in your Zoom chat right now. So we'd love to get your feedback on that. But really, a huge thank you to Hunter, Nathan, and the File Foreign Foundation for the Decentralized Web team and your partnership and support of this work. Obviously, we just scratched the surface at some of the questions. I think one of the big questions was how do we stay engaged? So please continue to come to these events, come to the office hours tomorrow. The team graciously shared a lot of their own resources and email addresses. So feel free to connect with them as well. And if you have any questions, you can always connect with the TechSoup team as well. We're really grateful for your time today. And we hope that you can spend one minute just completing the survey so we can make sure that we make these events as successful as possible for you. So thank you again to our speakers and panelists. And we really appreciate everybody's time today.